All right. It is Wednesday night. Welcome to the next episode of the Red Delta Project podcast and live Q&A here on the RDP YouTube channel, helping you maximize your potential with minimalist approaches to diet and exercise. As always, I'm Matt Schifferly, founder of the Red Delta Project and of course, author of the books that help sponsor these episodes. The full list of the RDP library is down below in the description. And I want to be uh, give a big thank you and shout out to the RDP community for all of your support. The books on grind style calisthenics and overcoming isometrics have been doing extremely well. The support is extremely very much appreciative. I just checked the numbers right before I did this and uh, things are going very well and just I want to thank you guys so very, very much for your support because without your support, there's no RDP. Uh, when I started RDP, uh, around uh, 2009, it started off as a very small little thing that was easy for me to do with very little money and very little time. But now it's grown up into this thing that is much bigger and taking up a lot more of my resources. So now it's at the point where I need to have the time and the money and stuff to keep things rolling and growing as, uh, and making it a better thing for you. So I just want to extend a big thank you to everyone. So today's topic, we're talking a little bit more on the topic we had last week. Last week, I talked about what are some of the qualities that make an exercise good for building muscle and strength? What, like, what do they need? Or is, is that juggling kettlebells on a BOSU ball while singing the Star Spangled Banner while poodles circle around you? Is that just a waste of time? So I covered those qualities and I won't go over them too much just now. You can uh, revisit that uh, live stream and I cover it in the first 10 minutes and stuff. So today I wanted to cover what makes your routine good for helping you to build muscle and strength because a lot of questions out there i get a lot of folks asking me this is my routine what do you think uh, what kind of routine should i be doing yo michael good to see you my friend people are coming on the live stream here uh, so what do you want to make sure you have well the thing is our fitness culture these days loves to portray working out to build basic muscle and strength like it's rocket science, like it's brain surgery, like it's got to be so precise and you got to get everything just right. And is it better to do five sets or is it better to do three sets or is the rep range 12 or eight or should a micro cycle be three weeks or four? Most of the time is a complete waste of time. Most of the questions that we get lost in the paralysis by analysis really isn't going to matter all that much, especially if you're a beginner. And especially if you're like, dude, I just want to build muscle and strength, just general health and fitness, general health and fitness does not need specific plans or routines and stuff. Keep it very simple and straight to the point. How are you doing, Nicholas? Good to see you right there. So when it comes to building muscle and strength, we need to make sure that we have the basics covered. And that's what your routine does. The first thing you want to make sure you have is that you are practicing some of the basic movement patterns like I talked about last week. And you are working each major muscle group uh, roughly once, twice, maybe three times a week. Twice usually seems to be a good pattern for most people. So a frequency of twice a week is usually a good place to start. And here's the thing that people get lost in. They think the frequency matters. They think that, oh, should three times a week matter? Or is it twice a week better or once a week and stuff? The frequency is not what is the most important. How often you work a muscle group is not the whole story. The other half of the story is basically how well can you recover and allow super compensation to take hold after your workout, because that's actually what gets you results. You don't get results from working out, you get your results from your recovery, super compensation where your muscles recover, they make themselves just a tiny itty bitty bit stronger and better and bigger than they were last time, and that's where you get your results. So when we have our frequency, what we're trying to do is we're trying to time our workouts in such a way that we allow adequate rest and recovery between sessions. So the next time you get to your workout, you're better and stronger than the last time you did that workout. And so some people, due to a number of things, like some people recover faster due to age, lifestyle, better diet, better sleep, less stress. There's a million things that come into play with this and it can change for you too. Like right now, twice a week may be best. Later on in life, three times a week may be better, or maybe even one time a week. So what you want to be observing is when you do your next workout, are you ready to really throw down? Are you ready to just tear the, uh, the paint right off that weight machine? Are you ready to rip that 
pull-up bar right out of the wall or the door frame or whatever. You want to come into it as hard as possible. Think about it this way. Imagine if I said, how fast can you run around this track? You run around it and I time you. And I said, good. Now, every time you can run around that track and beat your previous time, I will give you $1,000. But if you don't beat your previous time, you owe me $1,000. Well, I would imagine naturally you'd be like, I'm going to play it safe. I'm not going to go when I'm feeling like off. I'm not going to go try and run around the track when my legs are sore and tired and I'm not feeling my best. I'm going to make sure I can go when I feel like I have the best chance of running around that track at a faster time. That's the attitude you want to have with your workouts. You want to hit them, not because it's Tuesday, not because it's twice a week or three times a week. You want to do your workout when you feel like you can just destroy your previous PRs or have the best chance of doing that. And like I said, usually it's about twice a week. Now, how uh, you go about that, it really isn't that important either at this stage in the game. People often debate like split routines or full body, should it be an upper lower split, push pull split kind of thing. When you have your basic movement patterns down, push pull, squat, flex, hinge in, and stuff, you're, you can arrange as however you like. It's more down to personal preference and just scheduling uh, abilities for you. So I really don't care what your weekly routine looks like. As long as you're getting that muscle worked a couple of times pretty hard, you're good. Regardless of what your actual workout itself is, you can do the deadlifts along with push-ups. You could do uh, squatting along with pull-ups or squatting and pushing. It's not like there's some special combination that you need to engage in. And if something just for whatever reason rubs you the wrong way, like, oh boy, I did uh, bridges today along with pull-ups and that didn't quite feel so good for whatever reason, you'll know pretty quick. And you're like, okay, change it around. Not pull-ups with bridges, same day. I'll put them on different days kind of thing. And to a large degree, that's how your routine that's best for you is going to come about, is you're just going to get the feedback from the routine and you're just going to kind of learn what works best for you. And you may be saying, well, I can do uh, like abs, like hanging leg raises three times a week, but legs uh, need uh, quite a bit to recover. So I'm only going to do those once a week or twice a week. Or you could be saying, I need to do my legs once a week, but then I go hiking or skiing on the weekends or something, which is often like my case. So roughly twice a week and three times is fine, but as long as you can get best recovery in between workouts, that's great. Because at the end of the day, the amount of time for the, uh, like if I said you're doing three workouts, if it takes the, uh, if you do those three workouts in a week, or if you do those three workouts in 10 days, it really doesn't matter very much. It's not like something happens at the stroke of midnight on Sunday or Saturday night and a new week happens and your body resets or anything. You, uh, you're just getting the same cycle going on. So using whatever frequency you like is best, uh, hitting everything twice a week and in whatever format you like. Now, as far as number of exercises goes, Typically, most people do better with two exercises per tension chain. So two pulling exercises, two pushing exercises, two leg exercises. You can add more, and I'm talking basic compound movements here. You don't have that many different movement patterns uh, when it comes down to movements. Uh, Bruce Lee was always talking about in uh, martial arts. He's like, look, we've only got so many ways you can move the human body. Like a punch is a punch. Unless you've got someone with three arms and five legs or something, you're not going to have that many different ways to move. So it's all going to be roughly the same, and it's going to be a fairly small a selection of techniques from one person to the next. That's the same with exercise, too. You're going to have generally a horizontal push, vertical push, either up above or downward for like dips. You're going to have horizontal pull, vertical pull. You have squat, maybe a lunge variant. Uh, you can have a hinge pattern, although hinge does happen with legs and uh, flexion and stuff. And even that is largely involved with a lot of compound movements as well. So typically if you have two basic movement pattern exercises for each tension chain, you're good. You're pretty good with that. And it's easy to break things up a lot. Like you could be like, all right, so what about my inner forearm and lower forearm and upper forearm and my uh, inner upper lefter uh, forearm on Tuesday and stuff, we segment the body into so many little tiny pieces. And this is usually a bodybuilding approach and stuff, and it just fragments things like crazy. For the vast majority of us, it's a waste of time. 
Like, yeah, you throw in some curls, throw in some tricep extensions. Okay, good. I'm done. You know, people all the time asking me like shoulder work, like how do I get the front deltoid and medial deltoid and lateral deltoid and inner chest and upper chest and lateral chest and lower chest and lower third. And don't worry about all that. Like for the most part, it's not going to make any difference whatsoever in your training. If you've got tension going in the muscle, it's working. It's going to do the same thing. Remember if your chest turns on, it doesn't matter what you're doing or how you're doing it. You got tension in the muscle. It's like inflating a balloon. Uh, doesn't matter if you're inflating it in the morning or if you're inflating it slowly or quickly. You've you got the same stuff going in and inflating the balloon. Your muscles are exactly the same way. You basically fill them with tension. And as long as you're filling it with tension, again, that comes from your mind. Exercise does not work your muscles. You work your muscles to do the exercise. So remember that it's your brain that puts tension in your muscle. That's usually where a lot of that fragmentation comes from is people think, oh, I've got to do a million different exercises to hit every little square inch of my chest. It's because we're fragmenting our tension in our head. It's not actually due to the exercise. It's it's in our head. It's a perception thing. Same thing. Uh, I know I'm broken record with this, but people are like, okay, so I do like wide grip, neutral grip pull-ups, and then wide grip overhand, and then medium grip overhand, and then medium grip underhand. And they got like 20 different pull ups but at the end of the day, it's almost exactly the same technique each time. You've got these small little changes, and yeah, it changes the flavor a little bit, but it really should not be a big enough change to matter. And the most of the difference, again, is your perception. You're creating the difference in your head. Once you are like, oh, elbow bends, bicep should be working. Turn your bicep on, turn your lats on, turn your uh, rear delts on. I don't care what type of pulling exercise you're doing, all three of those areas should be working like crazy. Once you get proficient at being able to do that, you'll find that every grip is largely the same outcome. You know, you're changing the flavor, it's good. Yeah, definitely have some variety in there. It's, I'm not saying to stick to one thing, but you don't need three sets of this and 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 three sets of that and three sets of this. And it just bloats up your workout. So uh, usually about two basic movement patterns, keep them different too, uh, horizontal and vertical, or you can go with like vertical and then unilateral. The more different you can make each exercise, the better off you are. You want diversity of inputs. When you have your movement pattern is 99% the same, you're not really creating anything different, but you're still spending a lot of time and energy. So essentially you're just spending a lot without really much additional benefit. So if you're gonna pick two or three exercises, make sure they're as different as can be to really give yourself a good stimulus. And then finally, like what do we do about sets and reps and all these sorts of things? Well, it's pretty simple. Uh, you have time and tension. Those are the only two real variables you have because that's all your muscles understand is how much tension is in the muscle and how long is it there for. And the more tension you have, the less time you can have it there for. Time and intensity is often how this is referred to. So if you're trying to train more for a strength or a very high output, you have short period of time, so low repetitions, right? And uh, that's more for strength stuff. When it comes to endurance, then it's the opposite. It's more time, more higher repetition stuff. And it's relative to everybody. Some people will say that doing 12 repetitions is light, high repetition stuff. And some people would say 12 is heavy, uh, depending on what you're used to. Uh, and then when it comes to building muscle, it's pretty much shown these days that it's across the board. You can build muscle uh, and create a stimulus to build muscle with a very wide range of uh, resistance and rep ranges. You can go heavy, you can go relatively light. As long as you're pushing your muscles to the point where you're uh, really kind of taking them to a high level of fatigue, that's the more important stimulus. So the strategy I usually recommend to folks is uh, start with a warm up, of course. Anything that just kind of gets your muscles and everything used to uh, warming up for the exercise, usually lighter versions of the exercise is a good way to go. And then go into strength work. So keep it heavy and keep it low repetition, relatively low repetition. And for me personally, I've always just keep doing sets as long as you can keep the quality up. Don't say I'm gonna do 10 sets and at the same time, I wouldn't tell someone do only two sets. Usually when I'm working with clients, I give them three. But for me, it's like, I'm just gonna keep going until I feel like my ability to really churn out the output of my muscles starts to decline. So today I was doing like commando pull-ups where you know this arm is doing most of the work and I got pretty much like a five by five 
only the last two sets were really four and four. And then set six was like two. I was like, all right, I'm on the downward slide. Cut it right there. And I cut it because my muscles were starting to really tire out. I wasn't able to really push them pretty hard. And then I pushed them uh, to the last little bit with you know, hypertrophy phase in grind style calisthenics of rows, high rep rows. And I just got a good set and it's just go until I don't go no more kind of thing. And that's usually a pretty good strategy for kind of mixing strength and hypertrophy work together because you're tiring your muscles out, you're pushing them to a very high level of fatigue, especially with the finishing say, phase in grind style calisthenics, but you also have the heavier, lower repetition stuff you have earlier on. So you're really training for that strength. So you're getting the best of both worlds. Uh, and that's generally my recommendation for building a strength and muscle building routine. You got a lot of flexibility. You can use any kind of tools you like. You can do almost any kind of exercises that you like, as long as it's following basic movement patterns, push, pull, and squat, and so on. It really doesn't matter that much of, should it be like dips? Should it be straight bar dips? Should it be dips on rings? Should it be dips on like a weight machine? Uh, should it be bench press? Should it be dumbbell bench press? Should it be push-ups? It really isn't that important because remember, muscles are really simple tissues. They have an origin and an insertion and they work and they fill up with tension to bring the two closer together. And that's it. That's literally the only instructions your muscles have is how much tension can they generate to bring the two together against resistance and how often or how long can they keep that contraction going for? Those are the only variables you really have in a strength and muscle building routine. Everything else is just personal preference, personal resources. Like I don't have uh, dip bars, but I've got uh, gymnastics rings. Okay. And you're going with gymnastics rings. A lot of what makes a routine work as far as the details is just personalization, basing it off of what do you like to do? What can you do based on your schedule, based on your resources, based on uh, what can you do? Maybe you got to work around an injury. Uh, maybe you just prefer certain exercises. You could be like, I love deadlifts, but I hate kettlebell swings. Okay, no kettlebell swings. We'll do deadlifts instead. You know, use what you feel it just works best for you kind of thing. So you have a lot of flexibility when it comes to building muscle and strength. So those are the basic tenets, I would say. Whenever someone says, what do you think of my routine? I'm just looking at it like, well, is it fairly balanced? Like you're not doing a million pushing exercises to one pull. And is it in the right direction? Like rep ranges are not crazy. Like I do a thousand pushups. It's like, eh, it can't be that intense then. Can't be building that much strength if you can do a thousand pushups in a row. Uh, and again, a couple times a week. And that's about all I really look for. That's all I really care to, to look into uh, for the most part is just, well, do you like doing it? Is it something you can maintain and sustain? And always don't forget that your routine doesn't get you results. <clears throat> I'm always saying a good routine is like a launch pad for a rocket. It keeps you stable and it points you in the right direction, but that's it. It doesn't get the rocket into space. Your routine is not what builds your muscle. It's not what builds your strength. It's what just gives you some structure and some direction. It's up to you to hit that launch button when you're doing it and take your workouts to the next level with progression. That's the topic for next week's episode. So I'm going to talk about some of the strategies that you can implement to make sure you're making progressive steps in each workout because it's the progression that gets you results, not whether or not you're satisfying some sort of a fancy rep scheme or some fancy body part split and stuff because for the most part, it's really not all that important. All right, enough on that. Let's get into some questions here. Andrew, first up, how can you train for strength while doing calisthenics? Well, you gotta make sure that you're using techniques and methods that have a high level of resistance. Because strength in calisthenics is exactly like strength in any other discipline, where you've got to make those muscles work hard. You, If you're like, oh, I could do 100 push-ups, it's like, yeah, I could do 100 bench presses with just an empty bar, but people are going to be like, what do you go, got going on there for? Now, that's the general gist, though. You can definitely improve strength through neural proficiency, too. If you ever read Dan John's book, Easy Strength, which I highly recommend, the basic idea is keep it light and keep it very frequent and just keep practicing, practice, 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 practice. Get so good at the move that you can do it in your sleep. That's a strength uh, through neural proficiency. And that can be very good. So for example, if you're trying to get good at uh, your pull-ups, you know, do a pull-up variation that's relatively easy 
and you can practice it every day and you, it's kind of a grease the groove approach. And then when it gets really easy, then you can add some weight. But generally strength training is about making your muscles have to work extremely hard. Like if you could do an exercise for more than five reps, it may be a little too, uh, too light. Uh, let's say like generally I would, I would say eight reps is the upper range of that spectrum. So there's always adding weight or go to a more advanced technique. So you're uh, putting more weight on your hands in a push up, or if your hands are fully loaded, uh, then you bring it in close and then you put more weight on a single limb, but you want those reps low. You want them low because the lower you are, the more strength you will be stimulated. All right. Like. Black pepper, hell, I gain a lot of weight, so I can't exercise. Like even a diamond push-up is very hard for me, and I could do it very well before. I'm going to do a 48-hour fast, not back-to-back. -back. What do you think? I mean, I, I personally, for me, I'm I fasts for me don't do <laughs> do me very well at all. I I've done it several times, not a 48-hour. Dear Lord, man, that's that's going to be tough. I know a lot of people that do like 72-hour fast, and in some religions they do stuff like that too. Um, but uh, for me personally, I mean, <laughs> I've had better workouts while hungover and sick at the same time than when I was fasting. Uh, I do not do well uh, skipping meals and stuff for the most part. Um, but, you know, fasting is a good strategy for other people to work to calorie hack. Uh, that's why I mention it in my book, Calorie Hacking. But if, aside from anything else, I mean, a 48-hour fast isn't going to do you very much good. It's too short a period of time if you've got a lot of weight to lose. It's not really going to do anything for you in that 48 hours. You'll lose some water weight, but it, it's not going to make the big enough difference to matter for what you used to do. Uh, so instead, I would say use an easier technique. Remember, calisthenics is exactly weight, like weightlifting. Actually, come to think about it, it is weightlifting. Calisthenics is weightlifting. It's just you're the weight. And the rules and the principles apply the exact same way. The biggest difference, of course, is with weightlifting, you adjust the weight. And with calisthenics, you adjust your technique. And that's how you adjust your resistance. So if you came into the gym and you're like, I can't bench press 225 anymore, I'm like, all right, well, we're going to lift lighter weight. We'll go with 185 or 135. You do the exact same thing with calisthenics. All right, close push-ups not working for you. Let's try wide. Still too hard? Okay, let's incline you up on a countertop or a sofa. Let's find an easier version that gets some weight off of your hands so that way you're back into a rep range that you wanted to be working on. Now you have your diet in check. You know, you got your three peas at each meal, plant protein and portion size. Your portion sizes are not getting out of control, so you start losing the weight. You're active every day, and you're off and ready to rock and roll there, Black Pepper. So that's what I would recommend. But experimenting with fasting can be fun as well. But as always, I always tell people, in the journey for weight loss, pay very close attention to your energy level. Anything that's going to be productive for weight loss is going to be something that makes you feel good and increases your energy level. As your energy level is the most important thing. Is when your energy level is up, your appetite goes down, you eat less, and you're more active. When your energy level goes down, the opposite happens. You want to just sit and on your butt and eat all the time. So during fasting and stuff like that, pay attention to your energy level. If you find yourself getting tired and sluggish and, and uh, your appetite's going up and you're really hungry, maybe a little long in that fast, or it may be just fasting isn't for you like it is for me, and maybe just cut out calories in other ways. Um, but very good questions. Ah, uh, let's see. More here. I've been dealing with wrist issues. Oh boy. Any downside to push-up handles during straight bridges? Um, I'm not not in the immediate. I've never done bridges with uh, handles and stuff. Um, uh, straight bridge. Oh, I see what you're saying. I'm, I'm thinking of something else. Um, no, not in the immediate thing. But uh, as I've always said in in the past, being flat palm strong on the floor, being able to develop that flat palm strength is pretty much a necessity in calisthenics. Uh, Push-up handles can very quickly be a, uh, I mean, people say it's a crutch. I mean, but crutches aren't always bad. Like, you know, if you broke your ankle and you were in the hospital and it's like, can I get some crutches here? And like, no, it's a crutch. I'm like, yeah, that's the idea. I need a crutch. So if you have like an injury or something, then yeah, you need a crutch to, to deal with that. But uh, use what you can for now, but I always recommend like get a flat palm strength up as quickly as possible because it's going to hold you back. A calisthenics athlete who isn't comfortable putting their 
palms flat on the floor without any warm up is got a handicap. They've they've got a strike against them when they come to the plate. So I, I always recommend. And I gave this last time of the isometric exercise in my book of flexing the forearm and flexing up like this, getting the extensors, getting the forearm flexors, and holding and doing doing that every single day. That goes a long way at strengthening up all those muscles in the wrist, strengthening your hands, turning them to iron. So wrist issues are completely gone, and that's what you want. Uh, you don't ever want to feel like, oh, I've got this issue, therefore I need to make these modifications. You want to get rid of the issue, not uh, have the modifications. So use the push-up handles in the meantime, but get uh, so you don't have to depend on them as quickly as possible. Good, very good question. Um, yeah, very, Watan says, sir, you have a capacity for explaining complex topics in an easy way. I sincerely appreciate that because that's what RDP is all about is we got to take complicated things, make it very simple. And this is largely because that's because I always struggled with even moderately complicated concepts in school. I was always as a student, like the teacher would explain a story we wanted, they wanted us to write or something. I was always the one raising my hand going, I don't get it. I don't understand. Like I never understood anything in school. I was such a bad student. And some teachers would, uh, you know, they'd be patient with me like, all right, Matt, let me explain this the hundredth time for you. And others were just, you'd see them just die inside. I'd raise my hand and be like, I don't get it. And they'd just be like, oh, they don't pay me enough for this kind of thing. And, and I think for me, I've just over the years developed this ability to say, all right, I need to make this as simple as possible for me to understand it, not just for other people, but because you know, this is very complicated stuff. But when you have a fundamental principle-based approach to fitness, you get to make things really, really, really simple. So sincerely appreciate that because that's exactly what I'm trying to do. All right, well, Matt, what are your thoughts on multiple mini workouts a day? This is a really good one here. Someone had asked me uh, the other day by, by email, what about breaking up a workout? Like you do your legs in the morning, you do your pull-ups in the afternoon and stuff. I think it's great. That's personally what I do myself all the time. Uh, just because I like breaking up my movement throughout the day. It keeps my energy level up, gives me something to be loose. I'm not sitting on my butt for like eight or nine hours in front of the computer every single a uh, day, it gets me moving. And as I was saying, kind of with the workouts earlier, like as long as you're getting the, the work in, how you're getting it in isn't really that important for most people. Like if you've got uh, four uh, sets of hard pull-ups that you're doing twice a week, whether or not you get it, you know, like with push-ups or without push-ups and stuff isn't too bad. So mini workouts uh, throughout the day, I'm a very big fan of it. In my personal opinion, I think that's how we're supposed to move. Like we're not really bred or, or built rather, bred may not be the right word. Um, we're not really designed to be sedentary for long periods of time and then go hundred miles an hour and be super, super active and intense at a gym uh, for an hour after work. Uh, we're not built to do that. We're built to be active all day, every day in like spurts, more intense, less intense, you know, longer, shorter kind of thing. We're meant to be active all over the place. So breaking things up like that, I think it's just a natural way of how we're supposed to be using our bodies. And that goes along with why I always say a, a good warm up. A lot of people feel they need a long warm up, not to get ready to exercise, but to recover from being sedentary all day long. And they're like, I'm tight, I'm stiff, I don't feel like moving. Well, if you're getting little movement snacks throughout the day, you're pretty much going to be more action ready with minimal warm up on uh, ready to go. So, a lot of good answers there. Thank you so much for the uh, question. Henry, good. Uh, Matt, I've noticed that you've done neck vid videos that involve isometrics, which don't load the spine. I guess neck bridges are out now, but how do you feel about neck curls extensions like some do off a table? And this is not my best area of expertise, to be perfectly honest. I don't know. Some of those neck videos that I've done in the past were kind of a, uh, uh, a reaction video to uh, several years ago, Jeff Cavalier from Athlean X put out a video about how loading the neck with neck bridges and stuff was really bad. And he always goes from an anatomical standpoint of this is why, because your neck is built like this and you've got these nerves and you've got to be very careful. There's a lot of fragile stuff here. And if something breaks, it's going to be really bad. 
So one of the neck videos I made was, well, here's how you can work your neck without loading it in that way to save, uh, to lower the risk to the vertebrae and the nerves and all that kind of stuff. And I personally find it loads the muscles a lot better too. And that's kind of the way I've always operated is let's make it really hard on the muscle, but easy on the joints. And so that's what a lot of those videos are. As far as moving and stuff, I have to kind of side with Jeff Cavalier on that. I don't know for sure. I'm sure there's plenty of people out there going, dude, I crank the hell out of my neck a hundred times a day. I'm fine. But yeah, we've got small things back there. And for a lot of us too, the neck is a relatively fragile, underdeveloped area. So it may not be the best thing for beginners. So I would, a blanket statement, I would recommend more of the isometric approach. Besides we're using our neck largely under load isometrically anyway, I would go with more of the isometric approach for now, and then maybe go into something a little more dynamic, but keep the range relatively small uh, at first. But uh, uh, best of luck with those isometrics. Michael, good question. Any suggestions for focusing on traps, strengthening, and growth? Well, here's the thing with traps that a lot of people don't kind of understand is that a lot of times when people think traps, they think the stuff on top of your shoulders here, like what your shoulder, what your uh, backpack straps rest on. And those are your traps. Yes, those are your upper traps. But your traps are a much bigger muscle group than that. And they uh, extend down your spine, practically all the way down, almost to the middle of your back, depending on how you're built. They're a huge fan muscle that allows a lot of control for your shoulder blades. So shoulder retraction, shoulder elevation, shoulder depression, scapular rotation to some degree, not the major thing that they do, but they do it to a degree. So theoretically, any pulling exercise should be nailing the mother living hell out of your traps. Anything that uses your back, trap city. Now, again, the muscles are worked by your mind, not the exercise. So we want to make sure when you're doing your exercises, your rows, your pull-ups, your levers, carries and stuff, that you are very much aware and focused on that scapular control, either pinning those shoulders back or horizontal movements, your traps should be going nuts. But for the uh, idea for the upper traps, uh, Y flies on a suspension trainer, that works the upper traps very good because you kind of get a little shrug in there with that. Uh, handstands are also very good because you're elevating your, your uh, scapula when you're holding a handstand as well. So those are my top upper trap exercises. I have a video, I have a couple of videos on the RDP channel on uh, upper trap or trap exercises on body weight training. You can look that one on up. Uh, good question here. Any info on fasted burpees to drop weight to make pull-ups easier? I'm currently 220 pounds looking to drop some pounds. Um, I think we may be splitting hairs a little bit here. Uh, we've got, you know, first off, like, I, I don't care if you're doing burpees or not. Like, there's no such thing as weight loss exercise. Um, it's not like you lose weight because you do a special kind of exercise. Uh, you can lose weight doing no exercise at all if you have a caloric deficit brought on by uh, diet. When you're fasted, I mean, that's as simple as it gets. You're not eating anything. So any type of physical activity you're doing during a fasted state is going to uh, potentially contribute to that caloric deficit, provided you're not compensating after the fast, of course, where you're just like, okay, I fasted 24 hours, time to go hog wild and then you put it all back and that's how you get that yo-yo effect going on. Uh, so, I mean, it, it's not a bad approach. You're doing burpees fasted, not bad, but I don't think it's a you know particularly more effective approach than just going for a walk or doing any other type of physical activity that you could be doing. Uh, and even then, fasted or not uh, too, if you're just eating less, that's going to be the same sort of thing. If you're in a thousand calorie deficit, you're in a thousand calorie deficit, you'll have the same dent to your calorie balance, regardless of what exercises you're doing or what your diet looks like. Um, it's just probably a lot easier for some people with a fasting because that's the idea behind calorie hacking. Uh, check out my free ebook on calorie hacking on the RDP website on that is when you take a huge amount of calories out of your system, like with a fast or you cut all your portion sizes in half and stuff, it's pretty, it's a lot easier to make uh, that deficit happen. So, but yeah, I mean, go ahead and rock yourself on out. But like I said before, pay attention to that energy level. Like if you do say, I'm going to do a hundred burpees at the beginning of my fast and halfway through the fast, you're feeling like you could barely just climb a flight of stairs and you're exhausted all the time. Time to modify. We want to get those, uh, 
those uh, energy levels up as high as possible. Awesome quote here from uh, Henry. Oop. And then uh, 80s nostalgia guy. I like Zercher squats. I love Zercher squats, man. That is a fantastic exercise. It's one of my favorites on the new Dragon Door ISO chain as well. That's one of the ones where you uh, that you can do uh, with the ISO bar is uh, Zercher squat. For those who don't know, that's where you hold the bar in the crook of your elbow there. And it's front loaded. The reason why I like Zercher squats so much is because um, one of the reasons why a lot of people have troubles with back squats is because the weight is behind them and it's high. Even low bar back squats, it's still relatively high on the body, which causes a lot of people who don't have the quad control, the hip control, and the hip mobility, they're either not getting nearly as deep as they could, or they're bending forward and they're basically deadlifting or almost good morning in the bar kind of thing. And it's not terribly bad. It's just not the best way to go about it. And again, you're going to get your numbers a lot higher, but so what? Like if you want high numbers, uh, put a spring under your ass. That's going to get your squat way up, but we're not getting the muscles to do what we wanted to do. But a Zercher squat, what that does is it takes the weight and it moves to the front of your body and low, like almost to your hips low. So now you've got this much more stable, balanced position that you have the barbell or some people do with curl bars. Um, Zercher squats with sandbags is also fantastic. That's really good. And a lot of people find that it is so much easier to get a super deep squat, really good for hips, really good for mobility really good for that hip hinge that people often talk about. And um, it's also extremely effective for the quads as well. So I just wanted to add my two cents there. You're absolutely right, Zercher squats. I mean, that's that's the bee's knees right there. I would, I would have people do Zercher squats almost over any other type of squat any day, maybe goblet squats uh, kind of thing. But when we're talking to loaded squats, very, very good. Uh, Talking about the neck, back to the neck, which of the compound exercises can also work the neck? Well, here's the thing about the neck too, is you're going to have the neck engaged in any type of exercise that puts your body relatively horizontal to the ground. So push-ups, rows, and side planks are going to be hitting your neck. Now, it's not going to feel like you're working the neck a huge amount, but it is putting your uh, head in that most disadvantaged mechanical position with gravity that your neck's going to have to do some work. So anything where your body is facing the floor, facing up to the ceiling or to the side is going to be getting some degree of neck work in there. So fantastic, fantastic question. All right. More questions. I know I always run long on these sorts of things, but uh, I love talking to you folks. It, uh, Oh, awesome question. Oh, look at this one. Look at this one. Max Stewart. Thoughts on how to help big orexia. Oh, man, that's an awesome one. So big orexia. And think of the opposite of anorexia, where people, uh, particularly guys, oftentimes think, oh, I'm small and I'm skinny, even though they've just won Mr. Olympia. And they've got like way huge amounts of muscles and stuff. And they still think they're tiny little twigs. It's like anorexia in reverse. The thing is, self-perception is, is a very tricky thing. Um, it's often something that isn't so much a perception of our body, but a perception of ourselves and how we see ourselves in life. So oftentimes like bigorexia, what I've uh, noticed, and I've, you know, all guys have this like to some degree, is it tends to be more uh, problematic when people find themselves playing small in their life. And so they're, they're letting their boss walk all over them at work or, you know, they're just saying yes, dear, a million times to their partner and they're not standing up to, no, I think we should do this and let's discuss this. A lot of times this feeling of I'm a small person physically is accompanied by the thoughts and feelings of I'm playing small in my own life and I have a small voice and a small say and a small amount of confidence and stuff and internally and that gets reflected outwards into our perception of ourselves physically conversely like sometimes you'll see this in gyms too where you'll have a guy who is like not so much like confident but like cocky like really arrogant and so because they have such a big feeling and thought of themselves they could be skinny as a beanpole, but they're walking around like this, like they got beer barrels under their arms and stuff because they perceive themselves as being this big, huge, you know, beast of a guy because their perception of themselves as a person 
is that. So they're projecting that outwards. So usually when people are like, oh, I'm small and skinny and everything like that, I would say look at other areas you can grow, other areas you can become bigger in your life, being more confident, asserting yourself a little bit more in situations, making your presence more felt at the office or in relationships and stuff like that. And typically that spills over to our physical perception of ourself. And even if your body doesn't change, your perception of the body changes as well. That's just my two cents. I'm certainly not a psychologist in this sort of thing, but I've noticed that in my own life and I've noticed it with other guys is when they start to feel bigger uh, confidence is they don't feel like their body is too small, okay? All right, let's see, more questions. Do you still train with weights? Yeah, I'm a weight. <laughs> you know, I got 190 pounds here. Of course I'm a weight. Um, not really, not a whole lot. Uh, from day one, like I've always had a hard time with just external loads. Like now these days, like I'm in a job where we do small group training classes. That's part of the, the gym that I work at. We have these dedicated workouts and each trainer uh, has the same workout when every three weeks we change up what the circuit is. And of course, being the employee there, we have to all do those workouts. We have to go through those workouts. So if the workout says, do these deadlifts, do these kettlebell swings and stuff. I'm like, oh, I got to do that today. That's part of my job kind of stuff to understand the workout because you can't understand something without experiencing it. Uh, so in that regard, I would say, but I wouldn't say I'm really training in that uh, area. I'm literally just kind of going through the motions with that. I'm not really doing that as a training workout uh, per se. I'm not counting that as a workout. Like I'll do that and then afterwards be like, oh, I still gotta get, still gotta get my pull-ups in or something for the, for the day. Um, of course, I still do loaded calisthenics. Loaded calisthenics is one of the four disciplines of grind style calisthenics. I got the Kintsui weight vest. I've got uh, dip belt for weighted pull-ups and dips. But the weighted calisthenics is still a relatively small uh, portion of my workouts, just largely because I often don't find myself around where I've got that equipment because it's at the gym and I do a lot of workouts at home. And two is I just like feeling my proficiency improving with the progressive calisthenics. Like today I did those commando pull-ups and I felt it way more in my lats because I'm working on the uh, scapular stability in my rear delts and stuff. And it was like a total game changer. So I really like the progressive pull-ups and I don't really do a whole lot of the weighted stuff. So that's the extent. I know long, long answer. Long story short is pretty much no, but it, they sneak their way into my life from time to time, usually from uh, obligations than anything else. Oh, good one here. Lee Smith channel. Anyone doing push sled for legs? Love sleds. Oh my gosh. Sleds are so good. We have this thing called a sled mill actually at work. It's not a sled, but think of like a non-motorized treadmill that has resistance on it. So when people get on it, they, they really got to work their legs. Very good finisher for you grind style calisthenics uh, practitioners. If you've got sleds, if you're doing it at work uh, gym or something like that, or you could push a car, you can push a car, you could push a truck or something. Very good finisher for the legs. Good for that explosive power, jacks up your heart rate. And it's also very good too if you have like joint issues because it's all concentric. There's no eccentric when you're using a sled. So it's also a very good way to really blast your legs with less stress on the joints. Uh, so very good. Lee, uh, good one here. Any thoughts on heavy partials? Yes, absolutely. So range of motion, don't forget, range of motion is one of the elements of progressive challenges that I outline in my book, Smart Bodyweight Training, is your range of motion. That doesn't necessarily mean more is always better, but going with a shorter range of motion with a more difficult technique is fantastic. It's outlined in many of the progressive steps in convict conditioning, in fact, of do a one-arm push-up or do a pistol squat, and they're only going down so far. So heavy partials, fantastic, definitely good, and then you increase your range of motion as a way to go about it. All right, one more uh, question here. Michael, any chance still training your TKD? Any future videos on bags or pad drills? I still do my Taekwondo. I still do it most every day. I've got my little drills that I follow that I do. I was trying to find some schools uh, before the lockdown started because I haven't done any formal training in forever. I was like, I, I need to get back into it. Uh, sadly, my Taekwondo school back in Vermont closed down due to COVID, which uh, I mean, seriously, like that school was like a second home to me 
uh, the instructor I knew since I was 10. He was like a father to me. So hearing that that closed down in Vermont really, really hit me hard. That was really sad. Uh, and unfortunately, I think that's the case with a lot of martial arts schools here in Colorado uh, is uh, a lot of schools have been going out. I've been sending out emails, requesting information. Hey, found your website. Not hearing anything back. Um, it's not looking so good these days for formal training at the moment. But uh, yeah, it's uh, probably going to pick up at some point. Uh, I got to get back into it for sure. I mean, it's just, it's just been wreaking havoc. There was a there's a a calisthenics gym here called Awaken Gym. And before COVID hit, I was like, oh, I should get in on that. I should go to a calisthenics gym. That'd be great. They closed down due to COVID and everything. There's another one that I found called uh, Club Calisthenics. And I've been there twice and the doors have been closed and locked up. They still seem open, but they haven't been like open for business. So I don't know. Not like I've got a lot of time to go and take classes and stuff, but you know, you got to make time for these sorts of things. You know, as Dan John always said, if you're only training yourself, you have a fool for a client. So uh, it's definitely important to get some formal training for sure. All right, folks. Well, I have some salmon on the grill. I'm going to make up salmon, rice, and veggies for tonight's dinner. But uh, thank you again, everybody, so much for being on, asking your questions, for all of your support. As I was mentioning earlier, it means the world. And stay tuned for next week's episode where I talk about some of my progression secrets. Okay, let's use the internet lingo. Secrets that's going to blow your mind and all that hype and stuff. But no, seriously, what I'm going to be talking about next week will greatly enhance your chances of making progressive advancement. And I'm going to be talking about one of the biggest mistakes that people make, especially in calisthenics, when it comes to trying to get bigger and stronger. I'll talk to you guys next week. Till then be fit, live free.